Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Susan Axelrod, Editor-in-Chief at Culture, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the third and final installment of Uncork Your Potential. I'm here with Maya Goslin of Sip Wine Education, and we are in the wine room at Cheval Restaurant in Portland, Maine, where it's slightly cooler than it is outside, but not a whole heck of a lot. Um, we have a great lineup for you today again, as Maya always does, but just the first couple of, uh, first, first of all, a couple of housekeeping notes, sorry. Um, please ask your questions using the chat feature. Uh, we will try to answer some of them during the presentation, but then there will be a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, also, I, I know, understand that there has been some problems with accessing the wine samples, and we do apologize for that. Um, once again, those of you with a resale license can reach out to Pat O'Connell at King Estate Winery, and it's Pat O, P A T O, at kingestate.com is her email address. And we will once again follow up with that information in an email from us after today's presentation. So, our partner in this venture is King Estate Winery the largest biodynamic winery in North America. And since 1991, the King family has been making award-winning wines in beautiful Eugene, Oregon. We are going to be tasting some of those at the end of the presentation today. And uh, I do hope that some of you have received them. I have heard that you have. So before we get started, we're just gonna watch a brief video about King Estate, and then Maya's gonna take it from there. She has lots of ground to cover today. Once again, thank you for being here. Enjoy the presentation. People are looking for things that are better. They want better choices. They want to make better decisions about their food and the way they live. And I think biodynamics is going to deliver that to people. King Estate, as a winery, believes in doing the right thing and setting a good example, that it has an impact far beyond our boundaries. And uh, it's a message that is important in the world today. Biodynamics takes things to a different level. It, it turns itself away from monoculture, looks holistically at the entire state, and it judges the uh, diversity and the integration of a lot of different components. As an example, what we're doing says that it's possible, it's feasible, and, and yes, everybody can do it. And that's the important piece of this, and giving people a different path away from chemical industrial farming. Sometimes great changes come from small examples. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm so happy to be back here again today at Cheval in Portland um, doing this uh, third and final seminar uh, webinar for Uncork Your Potential. So today's, um, today's focus is going to be on now that you've built it, how do you get them to come? So. <clears throat> Um, before we get to that, actually, I want to do one quick note about wine storage, because you've now invested a lot of time into tasting wines and deciding what you're going to have for your store to set yourself apart um, and goes in with the philosophy of your cheese shop. Um, okay. Storing wine is, is incredibly important. So it's not just about what wine you have on the shelves. It's about how you're going to keep it in your bathroom or in the cellar or whatever space it, you may have uh, at your place of business. So you should be keeping wines, ideally, if you're, if you're going to be holding on to them for any length of time, uh, you should be keeping them in a climate that's between 55 to 59 degrees and humidity should be between 55 to 75%. Um, it's been hot here, it's been really hot all over the country. So right now, wines that aren't being properly stored in stores um, are going to suffer. Heat and light are two of the biggest enemies of wines. Um, they can do some serious damage in a short amount of time. So you just have to keep that in mind. Also, if you're storing wine, if, if you have high turnover on the wines that you, you stock frequently and you know that they're going to um, move fast, then you can store them in your storage space upright. However, um, if you have some other wines that you've invested in or wines that don't move as quickly, uh, I recommend always storing them on their sides, getting a wine rack or just shelving that will accommodate that kind of um, keeping them on their side. But uh, you don't need to 
contrary to what we're often told, uh, you don't have to rotate your bottles all the time. Um, it's sort of drummed into many people's heads that you have to rotate the bottles to keep the cork moist. The cork should stay moist with the wine on its side. That's the purpose of it. And really when you're turning wine bottles constantly, what ends up happening is the sediment gets kicked up and you would rather that the sediment stayed in place until it's time to decant it if that's what you would like to do. So that's my note on storing your wine. Take care of your toys. So <laughs> there are a variety of ways that you can market your business to set yourself apart. Um, what you don't wanna be of course is the same as everyone else. So when I go through these different options, these are broader themed, but take the ones that you think might work for your store's philosophy and also the size of your business as well. So if you're going to be doing wine and cheese tastings, and this could be either in person or you could be doing them virtually, depending on where your store is located and what the actual rules and restrictions are pertaining to live events. Uh, so if, you, if you're not allowed to do in person, then you can set this up to do it virtually. And if you are allowed to do in person, fantastic. So some of the themes that I particularly like for wine and cheese, um, and this is to market to your customers. I, also, these are ideas for them to take if they're interested in this theme and they can do them at home because we all love having themed parties in our house. So old world versus new world, um, you can do, you don't need to be country specific. You could do three wines and cheeses from old world countries and you could do three wines and cheeses from new world countries um, and contrast those. Um, and that's really interesting. You have to do a little bit of digging, a little bit of homework on the regions that these are from, um, but it will be, I think, of great interest and you can expand people's horizons for that. Country specific, always fun, tour of France, an afternoon in Italy, um, a trip through Napa. We all like to go away virtually since most of us haven't gone anywhere for over a year as it is. So that'll offer up a little, a little bit of travel for us. Um, you could even be more specific. You could do, um, you could be region specific uh, versus uh, country specific if you chose to do cheeses and wines from one part of the world. Uh, what goes together goes together. An evening of bubbles. Uh, this would probably be my favorite. Um, take a variety of sparkling wines such as Cava, Prosecco, Cremant, uh, the sparkling wine I was discussing um, previously that comes from other parts of France besides Champagne. Champagne. The American sparkling wine, you could do South African. Uh, there's bubbles from all over the world and you could pair it with cheeses from those areas as well. Um, this is really fun because of course, everybody likes the bubbles and as you get into uh, the cooler weather and the holidays approach, everybody loves to have any excuse um, to pop some bottles and, and sip some bubbles. One of the themes I think is really fun um, and alluring to people is amazing wines and cheeses you've never tried. And I don't mean you, the store owner, because you've certainly tried all the amazing cheeses that there are. Um, this is amazing wines and cheeses that you would like to showcase uh, that and introduce something to your client base. So if you have some very esoteric and um, unique and interesting dynamic cheeses that you would like to showcase, then this is a great opportunity to do that. And you can build on what we talked about last week when I was discussing those fantastic wine styles that most people have never heard of. Um, you don't have, you could select the ones you want to feature, do a little bit of homework on them, have some nice notes out, um, and then really showcase something that I think um, is both tasty and educational at the same time. And then playing off the old world, old world versus new world, you could be a little more specific, country specific. So you could do um, a showdown, a smackdown, you could do France versus the US, you could do Spain versus Italy. Um, those are all countries that are easy to pull from. Uh, they all have remarkable cheeses and they all have really fantastic wines and you can put together a pretty uh, unique and interesting list of, of uh, wines. And you could do this with, um, all of these you could do with uh, whites, reds, rosés, and then of course, if you and bubbles, or you could be bubble specific as well. So I think that those are um, some fun ways to, to showcase what you have. So moving over to wine and cheese of the month. Um, chances are you, you do feature a wine of the month, I'm sorry, a cheese of the month. Um, doing a wine and cheese of the month club. Um, people love clubs. 
uh, especially if the club is free to join. Um, it, mug clubs, wine clubs, all these clubs that you don't, the money that is spent is on purchasing the product, but um, it's fun to be involved with. You can send updates, you can um, feature what you want. So what I like to do is, um, depending on the store size, you could either do free wine and cheese options, like a free wine and free cheese, or a six wine and six cheese option. So this is what people sign up for. Um, of course, they're not obligated to do it, um, but in my experience uh, working with retailers, those who have a wine of the month option do very well with it. People love going somewhere and getting a six pack of wine. Um, a six pack of wine may not last a month, but um, it's gonna introduce them to new wines and it's gonna have them coming back again. And the same for the cheeses. Um, and in terms of packaging for this, um, I always recommend, I love the six pack. They make these really fun, like it looks like the milk bottle six pack, but it's made of cardboard, cardboard. So you can, and you can brand it with your store, your store's logo. So you could do that, um, or you could do wine totes as well. Um, and wine totes, of course, are reusable, recyclable. So that's um, something that I think is appealing uh, to people. And you can, and then depending on what your options are um, or what your restrictions are, where, where you where your store is located, you can also do giveaways. I mean, you can certainly do a cheese giveaway, um, a raffle every month for members of the club. If you can do a single bottle raffle, um, believe me, people are going to sign up for it. They they love this. And, you know, the chance to win anything is uh, appealing to all of us. We all love a lottery ticket. So um, reach out in that in that um, style, in that manner. And then highlighting a region or grape of the month um, along with your cheese of the month. So it's you can focus on, this is really, this is a great way to expand on your, your wine program. You could take three Sauvignon Blancs from three different regions of the world. You could take three Cabernet Sauvignons um, and feature those as well. So a Cab from California, a Cabernet from uh, South America, and then a, an Australian Cabernet and showcase it with uh, complementary cheeses. Uh, and that really, and that's your month long focus. So I think that those are also some really fun ways to, um, to, to reach out, set yourself apart, and also teach yourself and your staff. Because the more that's happening in your store with these sorts of uh, promotions and, and creating a niche for yourself, the more you and your staff are going to be tasting. Um, if tasting is something they can do and want to do, um, and of course, tasting the cheeses. So the more you know, the more you talk about. And again, as I've said earlier, it, talking, talking, talking to your customers, having your favorites um, and having a few fun facts and wine history in, in your back pocket um, that you can talk to customers about. Also fun trends, you, anything unique or dynamic you can come up with about these wines or cheeses. Um, customers love to hear that and they will buy what you suggest. They just need a convincing reason to do it. We all do it. I, I do it as well. I go out to a restaurant. I like to know their recommendation. Um, these are the people that work in these businesses. They know the product better than anybody else. So I usually take them at their word. And rarely am I disappointed. <laughs> so <laughs> shifting along, although it's the height of summer, actually summer just started. <laughs> it feels like the height of summer. Um, the holidays are coming. And of course they present such an amazing opportunity for anybody who's in the retail business. It's crazy. It's nonstop. Um, the holidays can be so overwhelming that many businesses tend to not want to do anything in addition to what they already have. You're selling so much product. Why would I make my life more complicated by um, doing something new and different? Well, because you clearly want to expand your program. And this is something that will reach new customers as well. And everybody wants more customers. So one of my favorite, favorite themes from Thanksgiving to the new year is get ready for the holidays, what to give, what to serve, what to bring. You hit all, all of the areas for gift giving and hostess gifts and presents and meals, and you can hit all price points on that too. Everybody wants to know what to bring for a hostess gift for a dinner. Everybody wants to have a great wine to bring to a party that's not going to break the bank. Um, if you're having a party, you don't want to spend huge money. So you're going to want to have a lot of wine, but you don't want to spend a tremendous amount. And the same, of course, goes for your cheese selections. 
So, uh, and then you've got your office parties, your Yankee swaps, everything like that. So what to give, what to serve, what to bring. And these of course are going to introduce wines to people who might not have otherwise ever discovered them. So uh, it is, and you set the price point, you can feature free wines, free cheeses in one price point, maybe three price points um, to kind of appeal to all, um, to everybody's budgets. I think that that's, um, like I said, I love it. I have found that my customers uh, and my classes love to have that as an option as well. So what to give, what to serve, what to bring. You also wanna look good when you are going somewhere and you have a great bottle of wine that not everybody has uh, and it didn't cost a lot, but they don't need to know that, hidden gems. Stock this stuff. So in addition to cheese and wine, you have an opportunity, of course, uh, as the holidays come in, but also year round as well, to feature other products for additional sales, impulse purchases uh, or year round purchases. Um, and some of these I think can be, they're, they're an additional draw. So I'm shopping here and I say, I wanna get this wine and this cheese and uh, look at this. They, it's not just baskets of wine and cheese, but they've got wine, wine books, wine and cheese books, cutting boards, corkscrews, wine glasses. Um, it depends, of course, on how much space you have in your store, but corkscrews, wine stoppers, wine charms, champagne stoppers don't take up much space and they tend, they're, they're easy buys, they're impulse purchases. Ice buckets, cheese tags, um, anything for a hostess to, to label wine and cheese on the board, I think uh, are fantastic. And I said it earlier, but the books, um, look into some, I recommend having a couple of really fantastic wine books on hand for yourself and your staff. Um, I also recommend having some wine maps, uh, whether you put them on display or you have them in the back for yourself, it's really helpful. Um, and the more that you're sort of looking at the maps, the more you kind of realize and pay attention and look at things and see, oh, that's where this is and now I get it. And then the more you, you study and become comfortable with something, the more you're going to talk about it. Um, so there's some fantastic wine books um, that are out there. I'm, I'm a big fan of Wine Folly. Uh, so I think that that's a, a really good, um, great pictures, great graphics and fantastic content. Um, so I think that um, order one up for your staff or sell them in the store. Um, and I think those will go. And then wine bags, uh, not just the tote, but actual wine bags. Um, there are some really um, nice ones that you can get. You can just get a wholesaler to come in and showcase you on some samples and see what what they have to offer. So set it apart. But then of course, um, you have to invest in a little bit of social media at this time, because uh, although you have all these great ideas and you have wonderful programs uh, that you would like to implement, um, how do you get everybody to know about? So clearly social media is part of our vernacular. Everybody's on something these days, but you have to know your audience, your clientele, um, don't waste a lot of time, energy, and money on various marketing programs if that's not who your target audience uh, is. So for instance, um, Facebook, I like Facebook, but Facebook is clearly a generational thing. So it won't work if you have a very young shopping demographic, um, but it will work if your clientele is um, of a certain age and older. <laughs> uh, going to Instagram, of course, well, Instagram is picture-based. So pictures, pictures, pictures are worth a thousand words and a thousand dollars. The more pictures you take, the more active you are on Instagram, the more visibility you have. Now, of course, it takes time and you have to carve the time out when you're setting up your tasting, when you're setting up your displays, um, because it happens all the time that you get so busy, you've made this beautiful display, the door's open, you've got the event, you're doing it and you have forgotten to take your pictures. And the next thing you're left with a bunch of half full bottles and eating cheeses and it's not a pretty picture. So it's not gonna do you any good. You wanna take the photos ahead of time and post them. Um, you can post to both Facebook and Instagram. Those are free and easy to do. Um, I have found that paid promotions, um, you know, you pay to have this, this picture or this event uh, blasted out on Facebook. 
I have yet to see results from that personally. I don't think that it um, reaches a lot of people. Uh, so I wouldn't really bother with that. Sponsored ads is what they're called. So more engagement, more followers begets more engagement and more followers. That's kind of the, the most simple way to put it. Um, and then of course, if you're brave, TikTok. So there's always another one. There's always something new. <laughs> there's always something right behind the next fad. Um, TikTok has certainly, um, it started off with a very young audience and it has become so popular uh, that everybody uses it now. And on people in the restaurant business, people in uh, retail, it, uh, everybody's making TikTok videos. So if you are feeling brave, um, I don't know that I am, but you can certainly make a, a short little TikTok video um, and put it up there. But again, you have to get more followers, more followers. And then you can always do an email, um, a, a well-written, short subject line, attention grabbing subject line with a nice picture in the email and the information and links to sign up or uh, whatever you want your links to take you to. Um, it's tried and true. Um, it's evergreen and I think that email will always be with us. So it's one of the, and again, for the most part, email is completely free. <laughs> so, and feel free to ask questions as we go throughout this, but for the most part, I think that those are some, some highly effective and relatively simple to implement ways that you can brand yourself, that you can stay really busy. Obviously everybody's busy, but you can. Um, you can keep yourself active and you can build these, these, and you will find that if this didn't work, all right, so my free wine of the month club isn't really catching on, but everybody seems to like the six bottle of the month club, so I'm just going to focus exclusively on that. Uh, your themes, you know, um, Bubbles was a huge hit, but nobody wanted to do um, old world versus new world, so take what works, build on it, what didn't work, toss it, or revisit it another time. So, uh, and now I'm going to just talk a little bit of um, a little more wine information that I wasn't able to get to before, because um, there's just a world of wine information out there. <laughs> but I did want to talk a little bit about pricing. Um, I've talked about how to price and recommendations on that. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the staggering amount of money that some people will pay for wine. So... <clears throat> I think that $30 is a good price to pay for a bottle of wine. Um, I like it if it's under 12, but um, $100 you're getting into some serious wines. And then of course there are wines that people will drop thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on. So there was a bottle of Veuve Clicquot that sold at auction a few years ago for $43,000. Um, this bottle though was uh, on, a sh on a shipwrecked boat that was at the bottom of the Baltic Sea that had sunk in the early 1800s. So the wine's about 200 years old. And something really interesting about storing wine is that when I was talking earlier about heat and light damaging wine and they can destroy wine pretty quickly, wine can last for hundreds of years. So just consider that wine was sitting on the ocean floor for 200 years in the perfect pressure, at the perfect temperature, in the perfect light locking. And when the divers went down, they knew the wine was there. They, they well, as soon as they moved the bottles, some started to pop because the pressure had changed. They brought them up on deck, popped some, and they were perfect. Uh, the pressure had stayed inside, and they knew that they had a, a pretty fantastic treasure trove on. And so they had been auctioning those bottles off. And that one bottle of Vuv that was on there um, went for that forty-three thousand dollars price tag. But that's been that two hundred years is remarkable. It's extent, it's surpassed any of our lifetimes, of course. Uh, and then just last month, a bottle of um, Grand Constance 1821, which was the wine of Napoleon Bonaparte, was sold at auction for $30,000. This was literally wine that Napoleon had commissioned. It was delivered to him in exile, um, in his years in exile, because he didn't actually suffer in exile. Um, but he died before this 1821 vintage was able to um, be bottled. And so it's been sold off over the years. And a couple of years, in 2019, this particular bottle was opened and tasted and deemed perfect. Uh, the Grand Constance was um, in the era that Napoleon was. It was one of the most popular 
with royalty um, and uh, elected political figures, presidents uh, in America loved this wine. So it was a sweet wine uh, and it's from South Africa actually. Um, so this bottle um, that was opened in 2019 and deemed perfect was resealed properly and was sold for that amount. So uh, that again, 200 years, not bad. Um, it, it, in truth, only a very small amount of wine that we invest in is really meant to be cellared and aged. Um, most wine that you're selling in your store and that consumers are buying, it has a one to three year shelf life. And for most of us, it has about a, a two hour shelf life, meaning we buy it and we take it home and we drink it. So <clears throat> of course there are wines that people buy and they want to hold on to for a variety of reasons. Uh, but it's, we're sort of a, you know, an instant gratification, you know, society. So we go, we buy our, our cheese, we buy that bottle of wine. You're probably going to want to have it that night or the next night, or you're going to buy a few bottles of wine and you're going to enjoy them in the immediate future. You're not going to be holding on to them. Um, it, wines to cellar, wines that need the, that proper um, cellaring and the, the right temperature and the right humidity. Uh, that's a, such a small percentage and it's typically reserved for, you know, Grand Cru Bordeaux's, uh, first, I'm sorry, first growths or Grand Cru Burgundies or um, uh, uh, cult Cabernets uh, from Napa, uh, really beautiful Pinot Noirs, of course, will, will sell her for a significantly long time. Grand Reserva Rio has all of those uh, you can sell her, but if you aren't cellaring properly, you're going to open that coveted bottle of wine up in five years time and you will be met with uh, wine that has turned. So, and the same goes for champagne. So although that bottle of Ruth Clicquot sat on the ocean floor for all that time, um, it was just chance or fate that kept it perfectly um, stored. Champagne is another one. People get a, a nice bottle, you buy a nice bottle, you bring that bottle home and you think, I just dropped 50 bucks, 60 bucks, 80 bucks, 100 bucks. On a, on a bottle of champagne or it was given to you as a gift and you know how much it costs, um, chances are you're not gonna wanna just have it with fried chicken that night. Although that's a fantastic pairing and I highly recommend it. So, and I know so many people who do this, they have the champagne, they put it away. Uh, and you think about having it, oh, maybe New Year's, no, I'm not gonna have it. And then time goes by, you move, uh, the wine goes from the cellar to the fridge, then it's upright, then it's sideways. Um, it goes from hot climates to cold climates, um, all over the place, light. And the next thing you know, you go to pop that bottle for the right perfect occasion, the cork comes out and you don't hear anything because all 250 million bubbles evaporated. Um, so it's very sad. So don't do that. Enjoy it if you want to have it. And if you want to hold on to it, please store it properly. And again, this of course goes for your place of business. Um, you don't want customers coming back with skunked bottles. So <laughs> serving temperatures is also something else I think it's worth discussing. Um, we tend to serve our white wines. And again, this comes into play, not just for your customers, but for you as well, if you are doing tasting. We tend to serve our white wines far too cold and our red wines too warm. Um, the more you have chilled something, the more the flavors and aromas are masked and hidden. Um, so white wine needs a little bit of room temperature as well. So the ideal temperature is sparkling wine, 38 to 45 degrees, light white wines, about 44 to 57 degrees, and full-bodied wines, 50 to 55. Light-bodied breads, I also think in the 55 degree range, Fahrenheit, and then big full-bodied breads, 63 to 68. But right now, the room that we're in is, is pretty warm. So the red wine, of course, will warm up quickly. So that's why um, I always recommend if you're in a hot location and you want to be enjoying that bottle at the proper temperature and it's 80 degrees, stick it in the refrigerator for a little bit of time or, or make a habit of keeping your wine in a sort of constant 55 degree storage area. But those are um, uh, warm, Overly warm, hot wine is uh, just an incredibly unpleasant um, experience to have. And again, with the white wines, very, very, very chilled white wines and champagnes, of course, don't you don't get the benefit. It's a fun test to do. Take a white wine that's very chilled, pour a glass, drink it, 
leave the bottle out on the table for 15 minutes and try it again. And you will detect all those subtle nuances that were hidden by the ice, by the chill. Um, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's definitely worth investigating on that end. Um, you know, but of course it's, it's, it's up to you as is tasting. Some people just like to have their wine super cold and their red super warm. Um, if that's what you prefer to do, then of course there's nothing wrong with that. And then since I've been talking about these historical heritage wines, these 200 year old wines uh, that people paid significant amounts of money for, um, it, it's always worth having this information. It, you probably will never encounter this, but just keep it in the back of your mind. Um, counterfeit wine is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. Um, when I say counterfeit wine, I mean wine that is not what it says on the label is inside the bottle. So there's a couple of ways they counterfeit wine. There is fake wine that's cheap. So it's being sold for $10 a bottle and it's really worth two. And most of that wine is sold into China. Um, just they sell huge quantities of it. And more counterfeit wine that they sell, the more the authorities up their game, everything's now very high tech, um, but the, everybody outsmarts everybody else. Um, then of course there's the fine wines. So it's estimated that it, it's estimated that 80% of fine wine sold at auction um, is is in is not what it says that it is. So if you're bidding five thousand dollars for a certain wine, uh, you need to have specialists with you um, to to verify these wines. And auction houses typically do that, but it is big business um, to sell historical bottles of wine or coveted labels. Um, and usually counterfeiters are done in by selling wine from vintages that don't exist or wine from an era where there wasn't uh, inkjet printing. Um, usually those are the sort of small things that, that catch them up. But I feel like in my line of business, every month I'm hearing about another major uh, bust of counterfeit wines. Uh, you know, they, they discover, you know, fake Brunellos in this warehouse in Italy and they discover fake Riojas in this warehouse in Spain. And, um, they're able to get it, but a lot of times they aren't. So it is out there. Of course, again, it's nothing you will likely ever encounter um, unless you are in the habit of going to auctions and spending five to ten thousand dollars on a bottle. But in that case, I recommend having a specialist with you and an insurance agent. <laughs> so um, I briefly wanted to talk about bottle size because I think that this is something that um is both interesting and it's also a way that you could make a really fun display so everybody knows the standard bottle this is a 750 milliliter bottle of wine five glasses they say although we all know that's four glasses um there is the smallest of the smalls this is a single serve piccolo you have the standard bottle there are probably 20 different names for different sizes but the big ones are the piccolo, which is popular right now for single serves in restaurants and, and grab and goes, um, single single bottles. Uh, a magnum is two bottles. Um, and then you go up, uh, all the way up to, there's Nebuchadnezzar, and then there's one that's even bigger, Solomon is the biggest one of all. Um, and that's about 18 bottles is in there. Yes, 18 liters, which is 24 bottles. And I happen to have here a Jeroboam, which is three liters, the equivalent of four. This was a gift to me. And I'm waiting for the right occasion to open it. I haven't decided what that is yet, but that's a pretty sweet big bottle of, um, and this is sparkling. This is from the Ferrari uh, winery in Trento, Italy. Um, there is a lot of pressure inside of that bottle. So um, because it's uh, got that champagne cork in there, that's one to open very carefully and store carefully. It needs to be stored on its, on its side. So I think that that's, um, so you and the Nebuchadnezzar and the Solomons, those are absolutely huge bottles. Probably you don't want to st stop one of those in your store, but it might be fun to get some different bottles in different sizes. The big bottle format, maybe not the giant bottle format, but actually the Magnum um, and the Jeroboam is are historically really excellent vessels for wine to be, to be stored in. Uh, this, this, the actual um, single bottle size wasn't the norm until uh, the 19th century. 
So people use larger um, bottle formats and the wine aged better, Bordeaux aged better, Champagne aged better, it still, to, to, it still does. So if you can get some empties or buy some and keep them on display, um, it's always good to have because you never know who, which customer might be in the market for a particularly, you know, fancy, fun, festive, big bottle. Um, again, they're eye-catching too. So or you could probably get one from a wrapped and empty bottle um, as well. And then, um, so uh, I have a little bit of time before we get to the tasting, but I actually want to talk about the grapes that we're going to be tasting today. So we've spent some time going over regions versus grapes. Um, today we're tasting two varietals. We're going to be tasting Pinot Gris and we're going to be tasting Pinot Noir. So Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio, Pinot Blanc, and Pinot Bianco are all genetic mutations of Pinot Noir. So Pinot Noir is the red skin, black skin grape that's true spiritual home is in Burgundy, but there's all these different mutations. Um, and clearly everybody is familiar with Pinot Grigio. Well, it's the same grape as Pinot Gris, but they produce remarkably different wines. So Pinot Grigio, uh, you can have high quality Pinot Grigio and you can have sort of um, mass marketed, crisp, lemony, zesty, um, doesn't cost a lot, has more sugar in it. Pinot Grigio, um, there's a big range there, but that's usually, that's one style. And then Pinot Gris, um, often grown in a different climate, a different environment altogether, different terroir. Pinot Gris will be a, a lusher, richer um, expression of the grape. So of course the Pinot, they say Stan, look refers to the pine cone, which is what the cluster of grapes resembles um, on the vine. And then the names, of course, Noir Black, Gris, Gray. Uh, Grigio is gray in Italian. And then you have Pinot Blanc and Pinot Bianco. Pinot Blanc tends to be from Alsace. Um, the most come from Alsace, although it can grow anywhere. And then Pinot Bianco, of course, would be Italian. So um, Pinot Gris has really it's I find it to be a bit more of an elegant expression um, of the wine and then of course Pinot Noir um, is the you you would have to not have heard of wine at all to not know how incredibly um, in demand Pinot Noir is and although it is the grape of Burgundy it has had remarkable success here in America in California but its true success has come from uh, it's from it, uh, winemakers cultivating it in Oregon and the climate there that is a little more um, similar uh, to that of Burgundy. So Pinot Noir is, it is a grape that can confound winemakers. It is very finicky, very temperamental. Um, it doesn't do well on demand. It doesn't do well on high yields. Uh, and for all that it is very problematic, um, for all that, it is still a winemaker's darling. And when done well, it produces exceptional, exquisite, world-class wines. So with that in mind, I'm going to take us to our tasting um, because we have these two wines. Now, before we taste, I'm going to quickly talk a little bit about King State Winery because we are now going to the Willamette Valley in Oregon, where both of these wines are from. So um, King Estate uh, was founded in 1991. Uh, it is family owned and operated, and they have really established themselves over the last 30 years as sort of one of the preeminent winemakers in that area, noted for their extremely high quality, delicious Pinot Noirs, Pinot Gris, as well as Chardonnay, and they make a variety of other wines too, Viognier's, Musket, uh, Rosé of um, Pinot Noir, and a sparkling wine, and their, their portfolio is, is fairly um, expansive. So Oregon, Oregon's heyday sort of started in the 60s with winemakers looking from California to a different climate, and they discovered that the climate and the soil in Oregon, and in, in particular in the Willamette Valley, um, when you planted Pinot Noir there could produce, you know, these exceptionally beautiful uh, red wines. So it's a maritime climate there. So there's a lot of 
uh, ocean air that comes in, it gets in through the mountains. Um, and it just, it's, you know, there's a rainy fall and raining through the winter, but then you have these nice long, dry, good temperature, moderate temperature, consistent temperature summers um, that really do um, lend themselves to creating these beautiful wines. So uh, with that in mind, let's get to tasting. And as we taste, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about biodynamic philosophy, but first let's get our wines and cheeses. So let's get our, actually, I'm gonna open a bottle of the Pinot Gris for effect because when I was talking in the first class about closures, um, this beautiful, and I was saying how I think that the Stelvin, which is what the twist off is usually known as, um, still, um, you see it and you're like, mm, I don't know. Well, yes, it's actually on ex it, extremely high quality bottles of wine. So there you go. I love hearing that. And remember, once this has been opened, if I didn't pour any wine out of this, I could reseal this and store this in my refrigerator for probably seven to 10 days and it would taste, it would taste delicious uh, when I poured it out. So to that end, I'm going to pour a glass. I did have one chilling a little bit, a little warm in here. Everyone get their cheese. We recommended um, two cheeses today for this one. So I had suggested Gruyere to go with both because as I was saying earlier, Pinot Gris is a genetic mutation of Pinot Noir. They're, they're identical. Um, so it, it would be interesting to try one cheese with two, uh, but you could also, also thought a Gouda would be very nice too, so. Susan, would you like to try? I would love to. Actually. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're having the twenty. We're having the twenty eighteen vintage. Um, Two thousand and eighteen being the year that these grapes would have been harvested. This is delicious. Absolutely delicious. Mm. So this is fermented in stainless steel. It doesn't have oak on it. So some Pinot Gris do. Um, so this has to, to my palate and tasting is subjective. Um, I'm going to say what I get. You might say, I don't get to any of that. Some things are, I would say, uh, irrefutable um, in terms of it's not oaky or it is oaky or it's buttery, it's not buttery, dry, sweet. But um, when I use descriptors, uh, if they don't match what you are tasting, then that's completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So I, in this, get um, nectarine. I get pear and peach. I usually get stone fruit and a nice pinot gris. Um, this is lush to my palate. And now your Gouda. If you have Gouda, if you're trying it with the Gouda. So the reason I recommended it to go with the Gouda was that it was a Gouda has a little bit of caramel. It's a little sweeter and those might work nicely together. Um, again, on the opposite effect uh, component. Um, but we'd love to hear your interpretations as well on that. Susan, do you have a knife over there? Right here. Did you want to try the Gouda? I do. So sweet and creamy, working well with that sort of lush. Mm. I get a little bit of spice in the Pinot Gris too. Um, so take a sip of wine, take a bite of cheese. Chew it quickly. Wine again, and then you'll see them work together. Beautiful. Mm. So initially, I got a little bit of saltiness, but then I changed into a little bit of sweetness. And that's a beautiful pairing, personally. Mm. Um, <clears throat> you like it? Yes. Creamy. <laughs> Creaminess of the cheese and then the wine, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Delicious. So I want to show you something with this bottle. So with that, with regards to that cap, so there's about a glass is worth out of here. So the more air that you air space that's in the bottle, the more damage will be done. So once wine is opened, of course, wine needs 
oxygen to live, to breathe, to aerate, or to in, in the body. It needs some oxygen to get in, permeable. But once the wine has been opened, then the oxygen starts to damage the wine. It breaks it down. If I was to leave this bottle out with no cap on overnight and pour a glass out tomorrow, it's going to taste a little flatter. If I reseal this, stick it back in the fridge, again, it'll stay fresh for a long time. If I bothered to put a bottle back in the fridge that only had this much wine in it, after a few days, it will lose most of its character and personality. And it will just taste sort of like cold wine, but not have a lot of these really beautiful flavor profiles that I was just talking about um, for that. And I actually got a little bit of uh, grapefruit in there as well. I got some nice acidity for that. So that's one pairing there. And you can try this with the, actually, why don't we try it with the Gruyere as well. This will be your one. Mm. So that creaminess comes out beautifully in that. Very different from the Gouda. I think I like the Gouda better. There's still a, that tart note in here is still coming through. I don't know if I love it as much with the Pinot Gris, but I think that the Gouda would be the, my first recommendation for this one. So <clears throat> recap that. And then now for the Pinot Noir. So I opened my Pinot Noir up a little while ago to let it breathe. Um, and this is the 2017 vintage. Um, so I have it in my glass, my pretty beetle glass there. All right, so Pinot Noir, I was saying good Pinot Noir is uh, an extraordinary experience. It should uh, sort of seduce your palate, right? A really good Pinot Noir does. Um, it's known for um, cherry notes and red fruit, other red fruit, strawberries, um, some earthiness. Let's try. So I'm going to taste it first and then, uh, all right, would you like to try some Pinot Noir? Okay, I have a partner here. And this is a lovely garnet color. Mmm, can't really see it in the photo. Carrie wants Let's to know that. what Gouda we are tasting. And this is from okay. the Cheese Shop of Portland. I will need to look it up because he simply labeled the package Gouda. It's a young Gouda, not an aged Gouda, but if you hang on just a second, Carrie, I will get the answer for you. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna take in some of that beautiful aroma there. All kinds of dark fruit that I smell. So smooth, it's so silky. Mm. Silky is the is one of my favorite descriptors for um, good Pinot Noir. Like I said, this should really just be a beautiful cascading in your mouth experience when mm. you drink good Pinot Noir. Really taste the fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Carrie, I do have an answer. Sorry, Maya. Oh, it's the Rispens Sheep Gouda. Okay. Rispen Sheep Gouda. So now. Uh, we chose this, the Gruyere is now the, so I tasted the Gruyere while you were out and then I felt that the Gouda personally was a better pairing. Oh, okay. Um, just me. Yeah. Um, so Can I try a little Gouda? Yes. Thank you. Oh, um, now the Gruyere. You want to try the Gruyere? Oh, I, wait a minute. I wasn't eating Gruyere before. No, the, the Pinot Gris was the Gouda. They're both good with both wines. Yes. <laughs> So the Gruyere. So the Gruyere with the Pinot Noir. Yes. Okay. Mm. Mm. There's a lot of texture in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You get those caramel nutty notes mm -hmm. from the Gruyere. Yep. That complement the fruit. Mm. It's like eating a piece of it's like coating my entire yeah. palate right now. This is this is a beautiful experience. I think for the juice. Um, so if people 
you actually try both of the cheeses and then with the red wine too. Um, there's the only way to figure out what you like and what you don't like and what works and doesn't work for you is to try it. Mm -hmm. That's what makes sense. Like, so um, I did want to take a moment while you're sipping to just go over biodynamic again because it is, um, you know, a, a core component to the philosophy that King State has with their winemaking. Biodynamic winemaking predates organic winemaking actually by about 20 years. It it was originally created as a concept um, for farming, for um, for fruits and vegetables for farming. So it's it's an holistic approach to winemaking. It's a it's a belief that everything in the universe is connected together. Um, it is organic in its in its part, of course, but it's it goes a little bit beyond that, and they follow a biodynamic calendar, and that is root days, fruit days, leaf days, and flower days. And in the, in the vineyard, this is when uh, they do different things. So you water on certain days, you harvest on certain days, and you follow this calendar. And like I said before, there's a lot more that's in, this is in a nutshell biodynamics. But um, overall, like I said, I feel like the wines that follow the biodynamic philosophy um, tend to have uh, more of a, just more pizzazz to them. They're, they are dynamic uh, as, is, as, the, as the actual um, definition should, should tell you. So it's um, something like I, I said, I, I don't know all the biodynamic wine producers, but I know that when I drink their wines, I tend to really like their wines. And uh, King State was certified biodynamic in 2016, I believe, although they have been certified USDA organic before that. So they, that is part of their philosophy. Um, and I think it really imparts itself into the beautiful nature of these wines. Do we have any questions today? We have questions? No questions. Oh, okay. Come on, you all. Questions, questions. <laughs> Take advantage of the wine expert here. She knows all. She's the oracle. Well, then I'll talk because I can <laughs> I can just talk. Um, there was something I had wanted to address uh, in our wine 101, but I didn't get to it. And that has to do with um, with labels of of designation. So <clears throat> when you see um, reserva on or reserve on a wine bottle. Uh, I'm often asked what that actually means. So think about it this way. Some wines from old world wine regions uh, have, uh, let's see, Burgundies are Cru, Cremier Cru, Grand Cru, the same applies to Chablis. You have classified first growth, second growth, growth third growth with Bordeaux. Uh, for Riojas, you have um, uh, Cosecha Crianza, you have Reserva and Gran Reserva, Chiantis, you have a whole range of um, designations, and then you also have Chianti Reserva, Chianti Classico Reserva. What that means for these regions, these styles of wine, is that they have to, those are actual aging for the Reserva, those are aging classifications. So uh, Reserva Rioja, for instance, has to age for three years, but one year has to be in the bottle. Um, and Chianti is the same in that it's, I believe it's two years, one year in the bottle. So there's, when you see that word or the crew, of course, belongs to it, it that identifies the wine is coming from a certain area, how much they can make, the grapes are X quality, their premier quality. All of those things are, are terms that a winemaker cannot use without meeting the criteria. Now in America, uh, the term reserve or grand reserve, single vineyard, estate vineyard, those are terms a winemaker can use on their own, but we don't have a sort of uh, definition or a dictionary of those terms, meaning there are a lot of rules in the United States pertaining to how much wine, uh, percentages of varietals and um, that has to be minimum, like a, 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 a Cabernet Sauvignon from California has to be a minimum percentage of Cabernet Sauvignon, X amount. And then the other percentage can be other grapes, Merlot, for example. But in terms of the reserve and grand reserve, that's often up to a winemaker's discretion. You can have reserve grapes that you have on a special vineyard, and you can have a grand reserve that is extra special grapes or extra limited. Um, estate, of course, would be on a separate estate. Single vineyard means that you're drinking a wine that comes with grapes from one vineyard only not from a variety of vineyards, which is many winemakers source grapes from different places and blend them together. There's nothing wrong with that. 
It's just what they do. So the rules are different for old world and new world for labeling. Um, you did get uh, a link to the Italian wine classification. Um, I thought that would be helpful as a cheat sheet for people. That basically breaks down for you DOCG, DOC, um, IGT, and Vino de Tavola, um, all of which are identified on Italian wine bottles. Um, counterfeit wine, it, Italy is one of the most popular countries to um, unfortunately to have counterfeit wine come from or wine be counterfeited from there, uh, but it didn't even come from there. So they have to constantly be up on really strict regulations and that uh, those the DOCG and the DOC labels that you see around the neck of your um, Italian wine bottles indicate what those wines are uh, and they have barcodes on them, um, serial numbers, I'm sorry. Spanish wines actually have now taken to putting barcodes on the back and, and many other countries have as well, meaning they're scanned uh, and they're, they go, when they go through customs because it's become such a, such a big issue. So um, I think that that should uh, give you a, a 101 of um, labeling as it were. And then just uh, one note before I thank you all, if you are in the state of Maine, um, a self-promotion, I will be on television tonight on New Center Maine 207. I'm going to be featuring a killer lineup of summertime fun wines. Um, so tune in if you want to see that. And um, I think that that brings me to about five o'clock if we don't have any questions. I would thank our host here, Cheval in Portland and our wonderful sponsor, King of State Winery um, for their uh, partnership and for these amazing wines. And I hope that if you didn't try them today, you get to try them in the very near future. And I um, hope to see you all again at some point. Thanks everyone.